hope you had a pretty good lunch. And just before start with the session, I have a short disclaimer for you. So you know, stomach is the limit. So I hope you enjoyed your lunch. And um, first, a few short words about me, who I am. My name is Martin, and I'm currently a software consultant running my own consultancy called Coffee Cup Consulting. It's a bit of a funny name for a company. So what I do basically is Java and JavaScript consulting. I'm also one of the guys running the events of the Bulgarian Java user group. So we have our own community conference as well back in Sofia. Uh, also, I'm a part-time OpenJDK contributor, contributing uh, patches to the OpenJDK project. And if you want, you can follow me on Twitter. I tweet about technology uh, quite often. And recently, I finished a book on RabbitMQ. So I'm pretty fond of the RabbitMQ message broker. Um, I've used it in a couple of my projects. And in this session, I want to give you a detailed overview of how RabbitMQ integrates with the Spring framework. So in the first part of the session, we'll do a short recap of what messaging and RabbitMQ are in, par in particular. And in the second part of the talk, we'll see how does the Spring framework provide integration with RabbitMQ. So how many of you guys have used RabbitMQ? OK, just two people. And how many of you have heard of RabbitMQ? OK, quite a lot of people. And how many of you have been using a message broker in your projects? OK, five, six, seven people. OK, good. So we'll start by providing a short overview of what is messaging, why is it important for us. Then we'll move on to RabbitMQ and see what is the difference with RabbitMQ and other message brokers. And the second part of the talk will build upon that knowledge and see how does the Spring framework provide support for RabbitMQ. So messaging, why do we need messaging? What is messaging in general? So messaging basically provides a mechanism for uh, integration of systems. You send messages between components in a system or between different systems. And in that manner, you can build a microservice architecture, a loosely coupled system, and so on. And basically, the central unit of such a system is the message itself. So a message has a message body and a message header, typically. And most systems that basically provide a way to integrate one or more system have this type of message format, a header with some metadata along with the message body that carries that data. And typically, the use cases of messaging are a lot, quite a lot. So some of them include, for example, log aggregation between systems. So for example, you have a couple of systems, and each one of them is logging messages. You can aggregate those logs through the messaging solution and write it, for example, to a file system, to a database, and so on and so forth. Another interesting use case is the event propagation between systems. For example, imagine that you write a social networking application and you want to trigger some types of events. For example, one user follows another, or you, can, you create a post and some users watch that post. And so you can use a messaging solution to aggregate these types of events. And yet, a third use case is, for example, if you want to offload long-running tasks from a web interface. So if you have a web interface and you want to offload some of the long-running tasks in the back end. And for that reason, you can use separate instances of your application and integrate them with the messaging solution. So these are just a couple of uh, use cases uh, where messaging applies. And typically, there is a variety of messaging solutions. You've heard many of them. For example, uh, Apache ActiveMQ, RabbitMQ, Microsoft MSMQ. All of them basically provide implementation for one or more messaging protocols. Among these include AMQP, which is actually the protocol behind RabbitMQ. Uh, you may have heard of XMPP, MQTT, and a number of other protocols. So essentially, there is a variety of protocols out there. Each proprietary solution typically implements its own messaging protocol or uses a protocol that's being standardized. But the, the latest is not very well common. Yeah, as we said, there is a variety of solutions. And um, now we'll, we'll see how basically RabbitMQ positions among the multitude of other solutions, such as ActiveMQ and TIPCO. So how, how basically can you differentiate the RabbitMQ message broker among other message solutions? So typically, messaging solutions provide for a number of things, not only sending of messages between systems and consuming them, 
typically a messaging solutions provide a way to route the messages. So for example, you can define your own routing rules between um, the systems. You can also, uh, they provide a mechanism for you to subscribe to the messaging system. So you can subscribe to the system in order to receive messages from one or more queues in that system. And also they provide you a way to secure your authentication channel. For example, most uh, messaging solutions allow you to enable SSL or uh, provide you with the mechanisms to enable authentication and so on and so forth. Um, typically, the messaging solution has the responsibility to route messages between systems using a particular protocol. But if you want to build an abstraction on top of that messaging layer, you can uh, use the so-called uh, ESB or Enterprise Service Bus. That allows you to integrate different types of systems, such as a database, an LDAP server, and so on and so forth. Okay, enough about messaging. So now let's see how does RabbitMQ differentiate. Uh, RabbitMQ actually is an open source message broker written in Erlang. Um, has someone used Erlang previously as a programming language? No? Erlang is a little bit different, actually quite different than the JVM. So in Erlang you don't uh, provide synchronization between multiple threads as you do with the JVM. Everything in Erlang is distributed and the Erlang virtual machine has the responsibility to distribute tasks among processes. And the way it does it is via messaging. So basically you can run thousands of Erlang processes and, it, uh, and they can communicate by sending messages. And basically RabbitMQ leverages these uh, capabilities of Erlang to create uh, quite a powerful message broker. Uh, the other thing is that uh, RabbitMQ implements the AMQP protocol. And uh, this is not by chance. So the AMQP protocol, or the Advanced Messaging Queuing Protocol, is actually one of the first attempts to standardize messaging protocols. It derives its origins from the financial industry, where a number of institutions wanted to have a shared way to send messages between them. And this is one of the purposes of uh, AMQP, is to provide a standard, standardized way to communicate between different types of systems. Uh, also, RabbitMQ has a quite a pluggable architecture. So it also provides extensions for other protocols such as HTTP, Stomp, and MQTT, not only AMQP. And the way it does it is via extensions. We'll see in a minute uh, during the demo how basically extensions are uh, executed by RabbitMQ. So, one thing that's specific for IMQP is that it's a binary protocol. So there is a specification that defines uh, several types of items that are used uh, in the message broker. And basically, um, the, the, the standard itself is not quite complex. So if you read the specification, it's just several pages that describe what are the different types of items and how they interact with each other. And here are some of the most important types of things that you can find in the AMQP protocol. We have the so-called exchanges, and the exchanges basically are the message broker endpoints. So, so basically when you send a message to the RabbitMQ message broker, you send it to a particular exchange. When you send that message to an exchange, it should be delivered to one or more queues. And queues are basically the storage mechanisms inside your RabbitMQ message broker. Queues are the, uh, the data structures that store messages and optionally persist them on disk. Another interesting thing about this is that the IMQP protocol is programmable. And this means that you can create all these types of items uh, using, for example, Java code or any other RabbitMQ client library that you, you can have, for example, for PHP, Ruby, and so on and so forth. Um, so, the other interesting thing about IMQP, apart from the fact that it's a programmer protocol, is that it also allows you to create multiple virtual connections inside the one TCP connection. And um, this means that, for example, you can create a number of virtual channels which you can use to send messages, instead of creating, for example, hundreds of TCP connections. And the reason for this, of course, is for performance. So if you create a number of TCP connections, this will basically provide a huge network bottleneck. 
And basically, the HTTP2 standard works in a very similar manner. You have a number of virtual connections that allow you to download at once, for example, multiple JavaScript files, and so on and so forth. So here is a very standard um, RabbitMQ setup. You have two publishers that publish messages to the uh, message broker. So they publish basically to one or more ex of the exchanges. Uh, for example, you have a message uh, that has some payload, and you publish that message to some exchange with name XYZ. When you publish that message to the exchange, it is delivered to one or more queues based on a key you specify. So for example, we have a key here uh, which is ABC, and based on that key, the exchange routes the message internally in the message broker to one or more queues. And when the message is delivered to uh, any of those queues, it is consumed by exactly one of these subscribers. So one message from a queue is delivered to exactly one subscriber. So this is the general setup of how basically RabbitMQ works. And typically, each message is published with a particular routing key. Based on that routing key, we deliver the message from the exchange to one or more queues in the message broker. And routing of messages is determined based on the routing and binding keys. So in that regard, we have several types of exchanges. We have a default direct fan out topic and headers exchange. We'll discuss briefly how do they work. So default exchange basically has the empty string as a name and routes messages to queues if the routing key of the message matches the name of the queue. Uh, so let's run it a quick example. For example, you sent a message to the default exchange, which is with the empty name, and you have a key of general. So when that message comes to the default exchange, it will check what's the key here. In this particular case, it's general and it will route that message to a queue called general. So remember, this key matches the name of the queue. So when that queue receives the message, it will deliver it to exactly one subscriber. This is how, how a default exchange works. A little bit more complex type of exchanges are the direct exchanges, which are pretty similar to default, but they work by actually using the binding between the exchange and the queue. So for example, if you send a message to a direct exchange with name chat, with a, with a key of uh, what's here, general, be general, then that message uh, is sent to a queue that has a binding to that chat exchange, and that binding has a key of be general. So here the matching is done based on the key of the message and the name of the binding here between the exchange and the queue. You can see that this is basically a different way to route messages between the exchanges and the queues. Yet, a more complex type of exchanges are fan out exchanges. So the way they work is basically by multicasting uh, messages between an exchange and the queue. So when you deliver a message to an exchange, it is sent to one or more queues, again based on this key here. So basically, when you send a message to the lock exchange, it is sent to all of the queues that have at least one binding to that exchange. The fourth type of exchanges are topics. And topics basically uh, also work in a multicast manner. But the difference here with fan out exchanges is that here the matching is done on the key. So when you send a message to the lock exchange, it checks what's the key of that message, and based on that key, it can route the message to one or more queues. And here, the difference with fan out exchanges is that it does not send the message to all of the queues that have a binding to that exchange. And the final type, actually, of um, exchanges are the header exchanges that work by specifying multiple binding keys, not just one. And they are useful in systems where you want to route the messages not on un only one attribute, which is the key, but on multiple attributes. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
uh, and apart from fuse binding and exchanges, we have different types of units as well. So uh, some particular things about rubbing and Q to remember is that we have the so-called virtual hosts, which allow you to provide something like a multi-tenant architecture inside the message broker, so that multiple applications can use different domains inside the single um, instance of RabbitMQ. We also have users and we have parameters and policies that specify different things, like for example, how to replicate a queue from one instance of the message broker to another queue, and this is used for high availability. Also, RabbitMQ comes with a number of useful tools that you can use. It comes with a management web interface that we'll see in a minute. Uh, it also comes with an HTTP API that you can use if you write applications uh, that use REST to communicate with the message broker. And they are targeted for managing the messaging broker. And there are some command line tools that ship with RabbitMQ. And this in particular are the RabbitMQ control and RabbitMQ admin scripts that allow you to administer the RabbitMQ message broker. Also, one of the interesting things about RabbitMQ is that it's uh, uh, has clustering support, and clustering basically does not uh, provide any uh, guarantees, for example, that a message may be delivered. Uh, however, clustering basically uh, is a mechanism that provides scalability in terms of queues. It does not provide high availability. In order to establish high availability in RabbitMQ, you have to define the so-called mirroring policies that tell you how to replicate content from one queue to another queue in a different instance of RabbitMQ. So this is the way basically that RabbitMQ establishes scalability and high availability by using clustering and mirror queues. So enough talking, let's see some um, demo on how RabbitMQ works actually. So if you install RabbitMQ, it's, it has a pretty clear uh, directory structure. Uh, it has uh, the so-called DB folder, which contains both the persistent messages. You can specify that your messages are persisted from RabbitMQ on disk. And it contains also the configuration of your instances, uh, which are stored in a NoSQL database called Mnesia. It also has uh, some scripts in the SB uh, directory that allow you to start the message, the message broker, to stop it, allow you to enable or disable plugins, and so on. Uh, there is also the plugins directory, which contains all of the Erlang plugins for RabbitMQ. So when you download a plugin, you just put it into that folder, and you can enable or disable it. Uh, there is the log directory that stores the log messages from your re lo local instances of RabbitMQ. And that's basically uh, some of the general directories in RabbitMQ. So what I'll just do now is I'll just start up uh, RabbitMQ uh, instance. I'll use the RabbitMQ server utility. I have a number of options I can pass to this utility. For example, I can specify the name of my instance. I can specify some additional parameters. But uh, for now, I'll just run the default uh, setup of the tool, which gives me a default name for my instance. And I've configured my instance to run with several plugins. One of these plugins is actually the RabbitMQ management interface. So I've enabled a web-based interface that allows me to uh, administer the message broker. And by default, it runs on a local host on port 15672. Okay. If I, if I open actually uh, this web interface, um, I'm logged by default with the guest, guest user. This is a user that comes with the installation of RabbitMQ, and you should not use it in production, of course. So what I can see here is that I have one instance of RabbitMQ running. This is this rabbit at Martin. And I also have two other instances which are currently down. Uh, that is why, because I have a cluster on my system, and I haven't started the other instances of the message broker. I can also see what are the connections to my message broker. Currently, I don't have any connections from publisher or subscribers. I can see what channels do I have, uh, what are the exchanges and queues. I can also create here exchanges and queues. And as we said earlier, as the RabbitMQ um, protocol, which is IMQP, is programmable, I can create all of these items here programmatically 
via any of the RabbitMQ client APIs. And for that reason, I've created a very uh, simple application. So basically, what I'll do is now I'll send a message to RabbitMQ and uh, I'll create a publisher that consumes that message. Uh, I have uh, this class default exchange sender. I'll just increase the font a little bit so you can see it better. Okay, can you see the source code now? Is it fine? So I have here three particular steps. I create a sender, which is a custom class uh, I'll look it into in a minute. And this class does three things. It first in initializes the connection to the message broker, then sends a message, and finally destroys the connection to the message broker. So let's look into detail, the details of these three steps. The first step, the initialized step, actually uses a connection factory which is provided by the RabbitMQ Java client. And I'll, uh, with this connection factory, I can specify things such as, for example, the host and the port uh, where my RabbitMQ message broker is running. From that connection factory, I create a new connection, which is uh, the actual connection to the message broker. And as you remember earlier, I said that we can create multiple channels inside the connection, inside the same connection, which are used actually to communicate with the message broker. So out of my connection, I just create a channel instance that is used to communicate with the message broker. The second step actually is to send a message uh, using that channel that I created in the initialized step. Uh, I say channel.qdeclare, uh, and I do this in order to make sure that my queue is declared. If the queue is already present in the message broker, then it's not created. So this operation is idempotent, meaning that I can execute it multiple times and I'll get the same result each time. And I specify some uh, predefined name, which is event queue for my queue. After I make sure that my queue is declared, I publish the message to the default exchange by using the basic publish operation over my channel. And I specify the default exchange, which is with the empty name. Then as a key, I specify the name of the queue, which is event queue, and the payload, which is uh, just a stream of bytes. Here, the message I sent is passed to this send method. And the final step, actually, is uh, to destroy the connection after I send the message. So the way this does is basically to just close the connection. And this step is very important, as it may introduce memory leaks inside your application. So when I close my connection, it automatically closes all of the channel connections. So I, I don't have to iterate all of the channels that I've opened. I just have to close the connection to the RabbitMQ message broker, and it automatically closes the channels as well. So let, now let's see how this works. I'll just run this example. Okay, it finishes with no output. If I go back to the RabbitMQ management console, I can see here that there is a queue created, which is called eventQ. Uh, and it has, maybe this queue was already existing because it shows me that I have one message pending that is not sent. So what I'll do is I'll just delete this queue. go back here and see that I don't have the queue. I'll run the example once again. If I refresh here, I see that I have this event queue with the message that I've just sent. But it's uh, under the ready column since that message actually is not, is not consumed. It just stays into the queue and waits for someone to consume it. I can specify per message time to leave, meaning that I can specify what is the timeout of my message. For example, if I specify three seconds, after three seconds, when I try to consume this message, I won't be able to do so. Now, after I've published my message, I want to consume it as well. And for the reason I've created uh, two consumers uh, that can be used for the purpose. I initialize them in a m pretty much the similar way in what I uh, initialized my sender. So I create a connection factory, then a connection, and finally a channel. So I initialize both of my uh, subscribers. And then for each one of them, I say receive subscriber one, receive subscriber two, receive. Into the receive method, 
how can I subscribe to the message broker? I say channel.qdeclare and then specify the same event queue as the name of my queue. And in this way, I ensure that I can subscribe to an existing queue. Even if that queue is already created, I'll be able to subscribe to it. But in this way, I make sure that I can subscribe to that queue. Then I create an instance of a queuing consumer that basically allows me to create a listener to that queue. And after that, I, I say channel.basicconsume and specify the name of the queue to which to subscribe and the name of this queuing consumer instance. In order to receive a message, I say consumer.nextdelivery and this operation will effectively block unless I have a message into the queue where, uh, that I can receive. So this operation is blocking. And after I get the message, I say, uh, I just wrap it into a string by calling new string delivery.pfbody and log it. Okay, so I just have one message that's currently hanging into my RabbitMQ message broker. And I have two subscribers that I want to trigger. So when I run this example, the first subscriber will effectively get the message into the queue. But what will happen with the second subscriber? Can anyone tell me? I have two subscribers. The first one is receiving the message uh, from RabbitMQ, and the queue does not have any more messages. What, what is happening with the second subscriber when I run this example? Any ideas, any suggestions? Sorry? It will wait until? Until, sorry, can you repeat again? It will not, but what will, will happen? Will it just die? Or? Any suggestion what will happen with the second subscriber? You are quite close, actually. What? Sorry? Wait. Yeah, that's true. So it will wait for a second message to be received into the message broker. And you get a book on RabbitMQ. You can take it after the session. Yeah. So yeah, you are right. So one, once I consume a message from the message broker, the second subscriber will subscribe and start waiting for a message. And it will hang. So if I send a second message to the message broker, it will be consumed by the second subscriber. And this program will just end. So let's see if that's really true. So if I run this example, I can see that I've received just one message and the, the program just hangs. And the reason is because the second subscriber is waiting for a message. If I send a second message to the message broker using the same sender class, um, yeah, let's trigger one more message. You can see that the second subscriber also receives the message and uh, the program just ends. So you are quite right. So basically this is how the message broker works in general. We can create uh, different types of messaging patterns such as request to reply or uh, fire and forget and so on and so forth. And you can do this using this uh, exchange queue topology where you can specify different types of routings. So now let's move to the second part and see how basically does the Spring framework provide integration with the RabbitMQ message broker. And basically the Spring framework provides integration with RabbitMQ in terms of three separate frameworks. Um, how many of you have heard of Spring integration? Okay, half of the people. So basically the Spring framework provides integration with RabbitMQ in terms of three distinct frameworks. The first one is Spring AMQP, which is a separate framework that provides several wrapper classes around uh, uh, RabbitMQ client library. The second is Spring integration, which provides um, output and input channel adapters for uh, RabbitMQ. And the last one is a relatively new fra framework developed by uh, the Spring team, which is called Spring XD. And Spring, Spring XD is a framework that allows you to integrate uh, data from multiple sources for the purpose of uh, big data analytics and processing. But it's still not a mature framework. So basically, if you want to use RabbitMQ through Spring, you would choose between Spring AMQP and Spring integration. 
So the Spring KMQP framework provides three wrapper classes around the RabbitMQ client library. These are, these are the Rabbit admin class that allows you to create queues, exchanges, and bindings pretty much in a similar manner as you would do with the Java client API for RabbitMQ. It also provides you the capability to create listeners uh, that connect to the message broker. By default, the Java client library does not provide you with the mechanism to create listeners. You have to create listeners yourself. And the last thing is the Rabbit template class that allows you to send and receive messages to and from the message broker. And also, all of these three utilities can either be used directly without Spring configuration or using a purely XML-based Spring configuration of all of the entities, such as uh, bindings, uh, queues, and so on and so forth. So in order to use Spring KMQP, you have to include this dependency, which is Spring Rabbit, which is coming from the uh, group of uh, Spring Framework KMQP dependencies. When you include that dependency, you can create um, in this particular example, I'm sending some message, and how do I do this? I create an instance of a caching connection factory, which is pretty much similar to the connection factory I showed you in the uh, Java client example. Then I create an instance of a Rabbit admin class. Then I create an instance of a queue. You can see that I use this queue bin here to create the queue, and I, I specify a sample queue name for my queue. After that, I say admin.declare queue, and I specify the name of the queue. After I declare my queue using the Rabbit admin class, I create an exchange using the topic exchange uh, bin. So in this particular example, I create a topic exchange with the name of sample topic exchange. Then I declare that exchange also using the Rabbit admin class. And finally, I create a binding between the queue and the exchange uh, using this util binding builder utils class that you can see he here has a pretty specific domain specific language that is used. I say binding builder dot bind queue to the exchange that I've created with some binding key that I specify. The binding key here is some sample key. And after I do this, I create these three items and bind them together. Finally, I say factory.destroy in order to destroy the caching connection factory provided. So this is how to use the Rabbit admin class. Nothing complex here. Here is how can I create a listener to RabbitMQ. Pretty much in a similar way, I again create an instance of a caching connection factory. Then I create the so-called simple message listener container. And inside that listener container, I register a listener with some callback method, which is called handle message. Inside that, this handle message method, I can specify the message as a string or any other Java bin that can be mapped to the message that I want to deserialize, that I'm getting from the RabbitMQ message broker. After I create this, I create uh, this message listener adapter instance that wraps the listener. And finally, I say container.setMessageListener. In that regard, I register the listener uh, to, to the Spring framework so that it listens for messages. And I specify what are the queue names against which I can listen. Here, there is something interesting you can notice is that I, I say set queue names and not just set queue name. This means that I can create a listener that listens for messages from multiple queues, not just one queue. And this is something that's lacking by default in the Java client library provided by RabbitMQ, something that the Spring framework provides additionally. And finally, I say container.start in order to start listening for messages based on the queues I've specified here. And finally, uh, let's see how the Rabbit template class works. Uh, I again create caching connection factory to my uh, RabbitMQ instance. Then I create an instance of a Rabbit template class uh, using that factory. And finally, I send the message using that Rabbit template instance to the default exchange uh, with a, a message key of sample queue, meaning that this message will be delivered to the sample queue queue. And this is the test message that I'm sending. So basically, all of these three examples that we saw 
uh, in the Spring Framework can also be defined purely in XML. So uh, these three examples didn't use any type of XML or annotation-based Spring configuration, but they can be used and defined purely in the Spring uh, configuration file. So you can get them as pure beans from the Spring configuration. Okay, and um, now let's see how basically to use uh, the Spring integration framework with RabbitMQ. So in case you decide that uh, your application uh, wants to use something more high level than the Spring IMQP framework, you can use the Spring integration framework, and in order to do that, you have to include this dependency again, Spring integration AMQP, which comes from the group of Spring framework integration libraries. And if you include these dependencies, you, uh, you can use uh, Spring integration by creating two types of adapters, uh, input channel adapter and output channel adapter. And channel adapters by basically serve as pipes that allow you to transfer messages from one location to another. Okay, so let's see if we have time for some short demo. Uh, so what I have here basically is uh, uh, all of the examples I've showed you, but let, uh, let's look at the Spring configuration and how basically to create these things using Spring configuration. In order to do this, um, I have to include the Spring Rabbit MQX SD schema. Oh, let's, let me increase the font a little bit. See if it's that XML. Okay, can, can you see it? Okay, so as you can see here in my Spring configuration file, I create a connection factory using uh, pure XML. Then I create a template and an admin class instance using only XML configuration. I also create a queue using Rabbit uh, queue, the Rabbit queue item. And then I create a topic exchange by specifying also which is the binding. And I create, I can create also a listener. And basically that's it. So as you can see, everything that I showed you in the examples can be configured inside the Spring configuration file. And it's uh, pretty intuitive to use. So it's, uh, there is no complex configuration you need to specify. If on the other hand I want to use uh, Spring integration, I can uh, define a channel that binds to, to RabbitMQ. And the way it works is that, for example, I create an inbound channel adapter, and I specify which is the Spring integration channel to which I want to bind. In this particular example, I will be reading messages from the test queue, and using the same channel, which is test channel, I will send the messages I read from the test queue to the test destination queue. So in this particular example, I use Spring integration to, to get messages from one queue into the RabbitMQ message broker and send them to another queue. You can use this configuration, for example, to replicate messages between queues inside your RabbitMQ message broker. And this is the way, basically, that uh, Spring integration can be used with RabbitMQ. And basically, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Yeah? No, I haven't used mass transit. Uh, is it an enterprise service bus? Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's a container for uh, message broker solutions. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Rabbit MQ, Zero MQ, MSQ, yeah. and other stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. So basically, what, what's the, the target of this container? To provide a way to integrate or to exchange different type of uh, message broker solutions that you can use? I guess you can use this thing for, for example, for um, uh, benchmarking. So in these slides, I didn't show you how basically RabbitMQ positions against other types of messaging brokers. But with this solution you mentioned, I guess you can run multiple tests against different message brokers and see how basically performance is in the different implementations. So the guys from Pivotal actually state that RabbitMQ is very fast. 
but in order to see if it fits your use case. For example, you, ha you have to send very large messages. You have to send millions of messages which are just four kilobytes of size. Then, for sure, you have to benchmark your particular application against different types of message brokers in order to see which is the more performant. RabbitMQ is good for one set of applications, but may not be so good for other set of applications. So you have, in order to choose the right solution, you have to benchmark. I want to ask an, another question uh, for the scenario you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, in the case of uh, two-thread subscribers, yeah. uh, uh, when the first one consumes all uh, messages, yeah. the second one uh, waits uh, for the other message. Yes. So the thread just blocks. So uh, if you have, um, for example, if you use a thread pool to create the subscribers and all of them just start hanging, you will exhaust that thread pool. But typically it does not consume uh, many resources. So the fact that, for example, you have to make sure that when you create subscribers to the message broker, you set some limit on the number of subscribers you have. So for the reason that you, they may not hang for a long period of time. There might be the other scenario when the queue is overloaded. For example, you, f you send one million messages to RabbitMQ and they are not consumed. So you can specify limits on the queue size so that additional messages that are sent are either dropped or persisted on the disk so that the RabbitMQ message broker is not overloaded as well. So it's very similar, but you have to make sure that either your client application and your message broker are not overloaded, but it does not consume a lot of resources. If you, for example, have 20 subscribers and in different threads waiting uh, to get some message from the broker. Any other questions? If not, then thank you for attending this talk. Hope you like it.